So Dr. Leon Wainwright is reader in art history at the Open University UK. His research has a trans transatlantic scope, bringing together the politics of historiography in art history with the philosophy of aesthetics and new approaches to materiality and geographical space in the social sciences. He is responsible for six books, including the single authored titles Phenomenal Difference, A Philosophy of Black British Art, and Timed Out, Art in the Transnational Caribbean. He is a former long-standing member of the editorial board of the journal Third Text and founding editor of the Open Arts Journal. From 2014 to 2015, he occupied position of Kindler Chair in Global Contemporary Arts at Colgate University in New York, and he has held visiting roles at UC Berkeley, Yale University, and the University of Oxford. In 2013, he became a recipient of the Philip Leverhulme Prize in the History of Art. And just finally as well, it's really nice to have him here. Um, Leon was also my external PhD examiner, so it's nice to have him in a different capacity, which is not as stressful. Um, so welcome back, and if we can just applaud him as he comes up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Opie. Okay, yeah, it feels like um, <clears throat> it's kind of like my turn to be um, in the Viva chair. Uh, <laughs> so uh, imagine this is payback time, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, thank you, and thanks very much for the invitation. Okay. So last year, uh, 2017, marked for me the end of two decades of scholarly interest in art and artists of African, Asian and Caribbean backgrounds in Britain, culminating with the publication that Opie mentioned, the book Phenomenal Difference, A Philosophy of Black British Art. The book seeks to expose the gains and losses that have been made by cultural commentary that aims to elevate the importance of such art and to galvanize artists and transform the attitudes of art audiences. It questions indeed whether a transformative discursive space for creativity in contemporary Britain can be built around the existing terms of analysis on diaspora, black and marginalized subjectivities, or whether this is now the time to transpose this history of art into a more distinctively philosophical field, and thereby make use of some, I suppose, contextually less familiar approaches. During the decade of the 1980s, it had become common for many black and Asian artists in Britain to group together for the purposes of exhibiting their works, seeking to foreground the issues and difficulties involved in establishing the public display of their art, with notable struggles at the levels of education, resources, and reception. The ensuing narratives of making and exhibiting this art have been elaborated in a remarkably and notably critical line of thought, writing that includes polemical interventions and historical overviews, documentary and archiving projects. And such perspectives have seen a recent renewal of interest within the academy, sustaining the concentration of effort from previous decades by showing how artists produce their works out of a range of experiences that come with living in diaspora communities in Britain, and how art making itself is a field of inscription and identification in the sphere of public culture. Such a conceptualization takes its cues, I would say, from post-structuralist scholarship on everyday signifying or semiotic-like practices of making things mean, applied to the evaluation of black and Asian British artist participation in filmmaking, photography, performance, painting, installation, and so on, as well as more broadly based in involvements in exhibition curating, publishing, archiving, arts act organizing, and activism. And in this way, black British art has been conceived as a corpus of practices consisting of performed identities with productive relationships and articulations between contemporary art and difference. Against the background of such attention, however, by the end of the 20th century, many artists of ethnic, uh, diverse ethnic or racial backgrounds in contemporary Britain began to feel unsure about the lasting value of this mode of cultural criticism. Black British art, as it came to be identified, seemed almost exclusively governed by the drive to make visual texts that held the goal of cultural representation centrally in view, 
and what appeared to be a predominance of interest in revisionism and political opposition. It was a trend consistently noted by Rashid Arin from uh, his writings uh, of the late 1980s. Those associations brought many such artists to a sort of on pass, I would say, as they came to feel encumbered with the matters of cultural identity and its politics that dominated their art's reception. That has extended, indeed, to a general feeling of discomfort among artists with regard to the black British label of identification. It's a situation that bears comparison, I would say, with the United States, where complaints of reductionism have emerged from certain American artists and thinkers and a desire to move, I quote, beyond black representational space in favour of a mode of strategic formalism, I'm quoting from uh, Derby English, within art, histori art historiography. One that draws out, quoting English again, the peculiarity of artworks within their varied contexts of meaning, responsive to the specific artistic operations that often manifest relations and differences to which culturalist regimes of representation must remain blind. Well, while this presentation is not really the place to demonstrate how a critical approach to analysing art came about in this context, uh, a sort of genealogy of the formation of a discourse on black British art, um, which is something I've attempted to do in, in, in my book, it does bear repetition, I would say, that the long-standing attitude of commentators in their support for British artists of diaspora backgrounds has brought mixed outcomes. The preoccupations with struggles over cultural representation may even have become an obstacle, some have said intellectually and institutionally, in the way of a more rounded understanding of this art. And that, I'm going to um, try to suggest, is certainly the case in the particular circumstances of the art of Sonia Karana, who is an artist who stayed in Britain for two years in the late 1990s during her postgraduate study at the Royal College of Art in London. And at that time I came to know the artist and began to interview her about her work, feeling from the moment of our first acquaintance in 1999 that each, taken together, the artist and her work represented a challenge to the analytical frameworks that then seemed uh, to be predominant. Sonia Karana was born in 1968 and grew up in India and has worked in New Delhi for much of her professional life, travelling extensively for residencies, art events and exhibitions and moving throughout a more global network. Karana's artworks have taken a deliberate and extended look at phenomenology, promoting interest in the intimate and at the same time philosophically significant relations that can emerge in the spaces and connections between artists, artworks, uh, audiences and so on. Foreground, foreshadowing many of her subsequent projects, the historical works that she undertook in London, which I'll introduce shortly, brought into being an array of physically involving and visceral relations in a range of creative phenomena including performance, photography, installation and digital practice. At the same time, by engaging with philosophical matters, Karana's art demonstrates a concomitantly radical purpose for art. The convergence of ideas and creative processes constituting her practice illuminates, I would say, by indirection that there has been a general over-attention at the level of art reception to differences of cultural, ethnic or racial identities, a process of representational positioning that surrounds artists such as Karana who work internationally from a base in the global south. Her art seems to call for a progressive and critical outlook and the grounds for community with the artist, mindful of differences of ethnicity and nationality, and that call extends especially, I would venture, to gender difference. And on each of these differences, indeed, my own subjectivity is marked out from Karana's. Yet, I would, I would say these have, this has not detracted from a personal sense of solidarity with her, indeed, these differences, uh, I'm going to suggest, may even have come to heighten that sense. How and why, then, has that bridging of boundaries taken place? Is the problem of difference more my or our problem than it is the artist's? If it's indeed a problem, what's its solution? How have we together, artist and researcher, tackled what some would say is a field properly 
perhaps out of bounds for me, out of bounds for, you know, Leon Wainwright in various ways. How have we together sought, as it were, to transgress? Well, seeking to channel attention to movement, time, gesture and illusion, Karana's art is an arresting nexus of making, feeling and thought. And it's a celebratory one, sharing her fascination for the agency of objects and the grounded materiality of mediation. The underpinning concerns of this art have come to seem more central in a current debate about how arts viewers are demanding ever closer attention and attempts to understand new sorts of interrelationships with art. Indeed, I would say that Sonia Karana has played a role in setting this agenda and as such her contribution, which bears on the theme of our meeting today, Encountering Difference, registers the growing intensity, the growing intensity of ontological inquiry currently at being addressed to and through art practice. So let me begin by underlining that Sonia Karana's art indeed I think is the very means for building a very urgently required relationship of mutual understanding, respect, agreement and so on, through and not despite encountering difference. She and I have shared an anti-racist initiative for avoiding the reduction of art and artists to ethnic categorization per se, to racial stereotype, or any notion of cultural character that would draw upon absolutisms or euphemisms of otherness. And this is articulated in how I've tried to respond to this artist and her work, in what I submit to be a mode of, of kind of art historical advocacy, and how I would recommend that we foreground the kind of art that Karana practices, that engenders a distinctive mode of relation that is simultaneously a matter of politics, intellectual inheritance, and experiential connection. The key to seeing such a relation lies in the material and phenomenal foundation of encounters with art that allows flesh to meet with flesh. Karana's art has stood as a consummate work of the body, and its significance can only ever be found or generated through the body. These are bodies in action, choreographed, motionless, or else bodies beyond the viewing frame. And in turn, they demand of their viewers not a response, but a wholly involving and evolving sort of relation, immersive, visceral, sustained, active. Karana's art practice calls into question, moreover, moreover, precisely what defines theoretically and physically the sentient body. I'm going to show stills of, of her various videos today, rather than kind of get into showing the videos. Um, f for instance, uh, this work from 1998, Breath, a colour video that was first installed in London in the late 1990s that focuses on the function of respiration by presenting the midriff of the torso in its continuous rising and falling breaths, flattened on a digital screen as a shifting form, an expanse of pink flesh fringed above with a narrow finger of white space. The image carries forward the insight from the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty that, I quote, it is clearly in action that the spatiality of our body is brought into being and an analysis of one's own movement should enable us to arrive at a better understanding of it, end of quote. Here, the undulating line separating fields of colour, two, essentially two smooth ridges at the base of the ridge cave, rib cage, whoops, is our only register of movement. In another of her early works, Karana's I'm Tied to My Mother's Womb with a Very Long Cord, a two monitor video installation, fixed one above the other, plays out aspects of a handheld camera carried along a shoreline. Such concerns with repetition and rhythm develop into the measuring and orienting devices for a study of the body. The discontinuity between upper and lower levels, uh, lower sequences, breaks the body into separate frames of time and location. It also entertains the desire to combine and rejoin them, which is met by the general realisation that their differences cannot be so easily reconciled. I want to make a few remarks on inhabited spaces. Karana reminds us of the importance of this sentient, playful, breathing body. That this is hardly a body in the abstract, detached somehow from its lived contingencies and surroundings. 
in Bird, for instance, um, which is this work here, she delves into the limits of the body and the world, limits that are simultaneously dramatic, elegant and amusing. The artist spreads her arms, lifts her feet one by one in preparation for flight. She lies on a block, rolling, kicking her legs, spinning, bemused and frustrated, while bemusing and frustrating the viewer at the realization that she simply can't fly. Merleau-Ponty's thesis of reversibility is instructive, I think, for elaborating a view of the conclusions that Karana's art seems to draw. Not only bodies, but also things in the world may be considered to have presence, he seems to suggest. Indeed, that they look at us by substantiating a form of visibility in which, I quote, the seer and the visible reciprocate one another, and we no longer know which sees and which is seen. In Lone Women Don't Lie, for example, Karana makes, makes inventive use again of split levels of upper and lower monitors, showing her head and naked shoulders, engaging with the vernacular language of the body, nuzzling, sniffing, nibbling on her lips and flicking her tongue. Evidently a figural experience is spoken, being spoken about here rather than one that is simply about figures per se. It's more like what the biographer André Marchand had in mind, thinking perhaps of the artist Paul Clay, of an experience of the forest in which the trees seem to be looking back at their viewer. As he puts it, in a forest I've felt many times over that it was not I who looked at the forest. Some days I felt that the trees were looking at me, were speaking to me. I was there, listening. Figurality is explored further in another of Karana's early works, her zoetrope installation. which employs the movement of a drum-like object, whose historical design once provided one of the few ways to animate static images. The subject of the display, again, is Karana herself, drawn into various poses, arms raised and open mouthed with, with head to one side as if delivering a song. She's dressed in black with lace gloves and a wig. At her waist is a reflective disc placed, uh, tied in place with an elaborate bow. This is illusion by mechanical means, dissolving the, uh, sorry, I thought I had a slide of it kind of within the drum. You can imagine a, the, the zoetrope with its slits through which you can view uh, these, these images um, of the artist um, as the, the drum rotates. It offers illusion by mechanical means, dissolving the separation between individual images of the body of the artist by a repetition of actions, with the impression of a continuous cycle, while inviting interaction from the viewer who supplies or initiates, and then can bring an end ultimately to the operations of this work. You can stop the drum from turning. Karana's art in, is in general, I would say, driven by the same imperative to join self and world illuminating the very effects of the boundaries between self and world, working to undermine the lines of resistance that distinguish them. Encounters of body and environment are crossings that urge a close analysis of how the body does not dwell in space, but is made of it, how subject and space are entangled and co-constituted, rather than separate entities that, sim that meet simply to interact. As the physicist and feminist Theorist uh, Karen Barrad suggests such interaction is better conceived as intra-action where relata follow relations rather than the other way around. In an art such as Karana's that sets up spaces of entanglement, the viewer enters in order to partake. We become complicit in the displacement of the boundary between the private and public. Let me say something a little more about this kind of um, the effect of this, these affective bodies. If you take, for example, her more recent work from the Lying Down series, where the ontology of being a body extends to an exploration of how the body may be present through its absence. In expecting, looking for, and mourning her body in some cases, the viewer gives it substance, 
Karana's body is not represented by the lines that she draws often around these uh, works on the ground, but is enacted through them in a kind of interworld, if you like, that might consist of, um, as it is here, streets or, or pebbles, uh, crowds and traffic, tides even, and gravity. Consider too how her, her, work, uh, her older work from 1998, Anhud, the original sound, is also a, an enactment of poetics, or more properly, a kind of physics of such processes, between sand and water, skin and time, that depends not on mere limits, but the elaboration of sights. A still image, a black and white photographic print of a, a, a kind of hairless naval area is placed next to a back projected video of a colorless surface of trickling sand and water. From some aspects, the grains of sand ascend, from others they descend, slipping and cascading hypnotically across the channeled surface, while across from, from them in a strong light source, the ridges of wrinkled skin remain unmoved. My sense of Karana's art is that here is a continuous project, continuous creative project, focused on forms of intercorporeal relationality, which is a bit of a mouthful, let me explain. It's an interrogation into the textures of embodied relationships that move beyond a traditional conception of body to include forms of entering the spaces of encounter and that try to assimilate these spaces, this is a quote from the artist, performing acts of abandonment, dereliction, dissidence. As the viewer confronts her body, such acts are not contained in her skin as something to be encountered or noted. Instead, abandonment and dereliction become emotional. They escape self-containment and move outside her body, affecting, reorienting, and reconfiguring the landscape and the body of the viewer, fundamentally rearranging their boundaries. My sort of final example, really, of such bodily relations and physical movement can be found in Karana's largest series of work entitled M. Other. These are photographs that were later developed into a video installation entitled And the One Does Not Stir Without the Other, which is made of, up of two parts entitled Sleep Restless and Sleep Interludes. Karana has an evolving writing practice in transition from what she calls script to video to poetic text. And the M Other, the Mother series, is another work of connections, as she puts it, materialized through textual production. Here, the artist and her mother lie on two separate mattress mattresses that are positioned on the floor, as you can see. These are two bodies in a visible, invisible physical contact, but also connected through emotional inv and invisible ties that the viewer can only be left to suppose. As the bodies turn and move over the time of their being filmed, they come into various points of contact, only slightly invading each other's mattress. Thus they find new points of encounter, and although their individual clothing is at times indistinguishable, it tends to remain the physical marker of separation. In establishing physical and affective connections, thus the individuality and singularity of the body is not lost, and the subject is never obliterated by its relations. In their separatedness, that allows for the generation of a space of contact rather than conflation, an interweaving of self and other in a scene of mutual encounter, a shared space of relationality. I think these works are quite definitive, if you like, of, of her practice. So let me en enlarge a bit on this analysis as I draw to an overall conclusion. Well, as this title, the title of this piece reminds us, the space of maternal love and affection here becomes not just the space of mother, but the space of the, of the, of the other, if you like, where the maternal comes to indicate connection without fusion. As artist and psychoanalyst Bracha Ettinger frames it in a, a matrixial theory of trans-subjectivity, the corporeal or corporeal becomes a psychic zone of encounter, care and awe for the mother or the other. 
it's a feminine psychic zone that is a space not of separation but of transmission. Where a partition between mattress, mattresses, mattresses, for instance, can assist in maintaining the diversity between self and other or mother. It can also constitute a space for the negotiation of alterity, Ettinger suggests. And while the viewer is similarly cut apart from the body of the artist having no physical contact with her, such a split is equally inhabited so that individual differences and physical distance enter the artwork not as limitations but as kind of heterogeneous components. In this way, I think, Karana's projects typically lend themselves to an exploration of the sensuous relationships that are mobilized between and among bodies. They are forms of perception that, while embodied, are not strictly located in or on the body at all. This relational body, bodily space, is never static, but is composed of twists, of detours and deviations, as a space that moves with us. This motion is both an e-motion, a form of moving outside, ex movo, our bodies, and ad movo, towards other bodies. The space of movement is then one of kinesthetic throughness, at the Lyman between self and other, the material and the immaterial, the visible and the invisible. And by enacting bodies as relational phenomena, Karana's art has occupied a newly diversified intellectual horizon, which resonates the emergent interest in the somatic within the humanities and social sciences. The interdisciplinary turn to the body from the late 1980s was indebted to a phenomenological tradition in developing an engagement with the body in fields such as anthropology, the medical humanities, sociology and feminist theory. This somatic turn in scholarship has been shaped by a series of reorientations which have grappled with concerns over being a singular body problematizing what a body can be, where its boundaries are, and what the potential beyond its physical boundaries might be, thus emerging with forms in which several bodies connect and expand their limits. Such questions are central to the current interdisciplinary interest in affect and its articulation through affective bodies, for instance, or affective practices. As sociologists, uh, social psychologist Margaret Wetherill puts it, these questions are raised as attempts to put the visceral in touch with the social. This approach places an emphasis on bodies as always in process with porous boundaries defined by their capacity to affect and be affected. The body becomes ontologically and quintessentially relational. The vocabulary and critical frameworks within this turn to affect and renewed interest in bodily experience come from various traditions within the fields of philosophy and psychology, ranging from the work of 17th century philosopher Spinoza and its adoption in, uh, in uh, Deleuzean philosophy, to the interest uh, in telepathy even and hyp hypnosis in late 19th century clinical practices. And while different, these vectors share an interest in the forces of connections between bodies that reconfigure the idea of the singular and self-contained body while examining its social and political. With various concerns and agendas then, these disciplines are focused on the centrality of embodiment and experience as exquisitely corporeal forms of being in the world, juxtaposed to more abstract ways of theorizing bodies and introducing a shift in the questions around experience from the meaning of having a body to the dynamics of being a body. It's through such a focus on the materiality of the sentient body, the, this, it's the worldliness of the sensuous experience that lies at the threshold between the public and the private self, the intimate and the, and the mundane, that I think Sonia Karana's work immediately asks new questions. It could be suggested that this material body's experiences are permeated by forms of corporeal immateriality, while the ontology of this earthly body always returns us to the problem of relationality. And in returning then to where I began, I want to ask what are the historical and perhaps moreover the ethical dimensions of these kinds of relations? Well, in general, what may be suggested of such art is that it shares a lot with the conjunction of circumstances that bear upon the arts to challenge the centrality of categories of the body that signify ethnicity and identity. 
I found it fruitful to alight especially on the art that Karana produced mostly in Britain in the closing decades of the 20th century. And I would underline the serendipity of having met, first met her during that time when in fact the mainstay of my work as a researcher was the history of British artists. And in relation to that period's identity politics and the wide promotion of cultural diversity emerged an art that was grounded in an ethos of experimentation and resistance, which Karana seemed to carry with her to Britain, where it found confluence with other artists and indeed with my own orientations as a scholar. Her art is exemplary of how artistic creativity has often tried to sidestep or translate the lexicon of cultural identity and ethnic difference, wary of there being so many mixed and adverse outcomes for it, perhaps what the American art historian Lucy Lippard had once called mixed blessings. In fact, much before scholars in the arts and humanities took their recent ontological turn towards the new materialism, it seems to me that artists of African, Asian and Caribbean backgrounds in Britain had begun to, had begun to expose cultural criticisms over reliance not only on the politics of identity, but its post-structuralist response in the academy. The very theories of art and textuality, semiosis and representation that made examples of cultural identi identification so transparent. And with all that in view, the complexity of the art that Karana made in London and the subsequent direction of her practice, I think should arrest the designation of her art as supplying simply another performance of ethnicized difference in the public sphere. She is typical in many ways. I quote Gita Kapoor, the art critic, uh, in being part of the lineage of women working through the body into a space of er erotic uh, efflorescence, recognized or shown to be almost definitively blocked, thwarted, problematized, and therefore one, if ever, by searing forms of self-exposure. Karana throws off the strictures of identification in a mode of resistance that she has shared with her London black contemporaries. Yet commentators, I think, should hesitate at the same time before trying to weave her into a kind of proto-universalist myth about contemporary art, such that it has lately assumed a spatially emancipated sort of global placelessness. There's no point in trying to dissolve the problem of representation here, I think, or to divorce this artist's early practice from the British context, nor to overlook that here in the late 1990s in London was an Indian artist somewhat displaced from India. Nor should aesthetics or the artwork be taken to exist a priori to identification and the issues of power that accrue in relation to how we identify, which is, let me be clear about this, this is a gesture that um, I would not want to repeat. It, it's a gesture that subtends patriarchal and, and white supremacist views of art and culture. Going beyond such dilemmas over suitable approaches to analysis, I've made much of the question of what would make for a suitable approach. There is the matter of the alternative attitude that Karana's work engenders in our relation to analysis itself, suggesting that the search for an overarching theme in this artist's art may be entirely beside the point. I feel that this leads any commentator who looks seriously at this art to reflect in turn on themselves. And that has happened for me too. The paths that I have treaded through her work have always led back to myself, even when that seems inadequate, <laughs> even paradoxical for writing that's designed to be about Karana and her artistic achievements. Indeed, writing about this art has required my involvement so completely that in order to take a better view of it, I've only ever return to my own presence, my own body and self-image. My own body stands before me and looks back at me when it's the artist's works that are the actual forms I seek. No matter that I try to take myself out of the equation for fear of prejudice, of distraction or even of privilege, the process has a philosophical depth within a social situation, 
since the driving forces for any account of the desires, emotions and poetics of relationality will remain those of the identities and politics of the subjects who structure it. Above all then, by, by paradox, Karana's art pinpoints the critical and aesthetic dimensions and poet poetics of relationality in a rare and important way, I would say. Relationality here implies more than encounter, such as when the self-contained body meets the world through its sensuous perceptions. The articulation of such complex relations by Karana calls for ethical responses, moreover, seeking ways of, I quote Joanna Zelinska, granting permission to be disturbed in the skin of one's own home. Her art sets up spaces for an ethical negotiation of subjectivity and positioning. That draws the viewer into the work, but also draws out from the viewer the sort of individuated, affective and cognitive responses that disclose the location and style of our standpoints on the world, our bodily comportment and our disposition towards others. The production of new bodies in relationality does not remain a matter of the out there to which the viewer is a witness. Instead, it always and already includes the viewer in a kind of metamorphosis where, I quote Braha Ettinger again, co-affectivity turns the borderlines between subjects and between subject and object into a shareable border space. This entire realm of intersubjective relationality, for me at least, is at the same moment the occasion for an ethics of negotiation, undergirded by questions, um, in my case, which are about my professional orientations towards the artist and her work, my choices over how to position myself within the politics of historiography and the politics of identification led by self-reflection in this kind of affective register. Karana thus revives in conclusion, a set of issues from within a field of philosophical study, which are thus. The matter of whether the focus for attention in contemporary art is the art form out there, or else inherently a way of studying art by way of a more ethically driven self-analysis. It opens up the matter of reciprocal lines of responsibility that may be drawn between the viewer, artist, and artworks, and I think it makes a resounding and incisive contribution to the subject, the philosophical subject of experience. I'm going to stop there and say thank you. Hello. Thank, thanks for that. That was great. Um, I, you, you were just getting to, I suppose, the bit that, um, to my to my mind at least, um, the subject-object kind of dichotomy and the breakdown of that, and what happens at that moment. Do you want to conjecture uh, a little further from your speech? Is that, is um, that possible? Uh, well, just in terms of ontology or the physical, yeah. or the phenomenological level. I actually don't really have any ideas of my own on that, to be honest. Um, I'm more interested in um, trying to articulate an, a sort of already uh, philosophized uh, field of debate about subject-object relations, which you'd find in, for instance, the posthumously published work of Merleau-Ponty, where, uh, at which point, um, for those of you who know it, um, for those who don't know it, it's a uh, it's the point at which Merleau-Ponty kind of has a, um, has a change of mind, if you like, um, a change of heart too. Um, and um, he says, you know, the, the, the problem for me all along has been that I've accepted a subject-object distinction, which we inherit from uh, the sort of early modern philosophers. 
And that doesn't really help us to think about intersubjective relations um, very constructively. And so he then goes off to create further sorts of cap um, to allow him to think about the possibility of um, closer, um, closer, more um, um, situated uh, relations with the world, right? So, uh, and relations not only with one another, but relations with things in the world. Um, and that out of which you then get this whole sort of account of the flesh of the world uh, in the, um, and the chiasma, the chiasm the of, of relations. Um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of set aside an entire chapter to that in, 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 my, in that book. In the, book. Um, the reason why I say I'm not all that interested in that at the same time is that I'm kind of more interested in how we articulate all of that to all of this other stuff that I've talked about with regard to sort of like, you know, the professional art historian encountering an artist or the viewer of a work encountering an artist um, and the extent to which one probably needs to hold hold open the possibility that there is a, a much a, there's, there's a kind of much closer field of intra relations to use the Karen Barrett um, than we have been able to capture in our existing kind of account of positions and criti critical cultural, you know, sort of cultural analysis. So that, that's, that's really why, why I spent so much time trying to work around sort of Merleau-Ponty and other s sort of um, theories of affectivity. Um, not for their own sake, although I did lay it on quite thick today, <laughs> I'll admit, but as a way of trying to, if you like, strip you like, if, um, uh, in a context that where it seems to me we've had um, a great deal of the sort of um, flattening out of possibilities for the ways in which people might interact and understand works of art and, 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 and artists. Um, and to try to give us, if you like, a little more, a kind of, to add a philosophical dimension that doesn't negate our existing understanding but might in some way kind of enhance it. So, yeah, that's, that's, I hope that answers your question. John, many thanks. For the art you've been discussing, is culture the problem or the solution? I thought you might ask me that. <laughs> um, well, we can't do without cultural studies because very early on, actually, in my sort of work on this, I, I thought I could employ a phenomenological uh, technique of bracketing and separating off a kind of existing field of discourse from the works of art that I was interested in amongst the, these mostly black and Asian British artists. And then I very soon realized that that was kind of um, uh, an untenable, impossible thing to do, a very silly thing to do. Uh, one needs to bear in mind that these works of art were produced in an environment in which concerns with culture were and are central, and critical concerns with culture are central. So you can't somehow presuppose that actually, you know, for instance, the concept of diaspora or black culture is like somehow kind of an aside that doesn't relate to this work because it's it's sort of ev sort of everywhere within the work and sort of at the same time. Um, um, at the, same, at the same time, it's a kind of offers possibly a kind of an overdetermination of what this work is about. So it's sort of both the problem and the solution. The di the difficulty with doing philosophical work, but I think I've sort of got there, is that um, philosophy is very good at kind of like picking up concepts and seeing if they they sort of apply, and then finding they sort of partly apply, and then discarding them, and then finding others. And what I've tried to do in, in this work on, on the black British context is to try to suggest that actually after doing all of this kind of philosophy, you sort of come back to the starting position. It sort of reaffirms your original feeling, you know, 
that um, there is no sort of aesthetic outside of the political. There is no sort of identity somehow separate from a concern with relationality. But being able to tease those things apart for a moment and to show how they, how they relate to one another is, a, is, is, is sort of my goal. So culture, of course, for a phenomenologist is a, not a, if you'll forgive me, not a, pre, uh, a preconceptual um, uh, thing. It's a category, it's a theme. And as far as Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, uh, Gadamer, or others are concerned, there's, we're, not, we're not engaging with art as if it's basically just a set of themes. I mean, we're trying to think about the experiential dimension of these works primarily before we go on to tackle those other aspects. What's happened in, the, this, in this context for me is that the, um, the, um, the process has happened the other way around. So we've spent lots and lots of time talking about culture and very little time uh, trying to think about the stuff that in a way kind of precedes culture, what Merleau-Ponty calls the kind of pre-predicative, the a posteriori, the, the actual materials uh, that are there, and in an interesting way, you know, for the historians amongst us, that it's these materials which kind of have this lasting, this lasting sort of presence, um, and um, that that can be described in cultural terms. But you soon reach a limit, I think. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> um, I guess I just want to ask about the materiality of the artist's body, and not just the cultural difference, but the sexual difference that mm. Ponte is often criticized for being very neutral about describing the body. Yeah. Could you say something about that? Yeah, well, he's not criticized. Uh, thanks for that question. This is a really personal one. I mean, he's not criticized enough uh, because well, he doesn't feel the brunt of that criticism because his, you know, you have to put his work in dialogue with uh, feminist interventions in phenomenology of the 1970s and since. Um, unfortunately, he'd kind of written all this stuff by then, right? So they kind of come after the fact. Um, I mean, I work through various of the of the fem feminist perspectives on on the body and the extent to which Merleau-Ponty is, uh, you know, guilty of this kind of thought crime, right? Which is <laughs> just to assume that there is a kind of there's a kind of normative body, you know, and that that's essentially going to be a bit like in my talk. You know, everything comes back to this person who's speaking here. You know, um, it's Merleau-Ponty himself that we're talking about. We're really talking about his body and his relation to the bodies in the world. Um, my sense of the the sort of consensus that has reached at in that feminist debate though and this is where I think we kind of sh we kind of share a view is that um, essentially what Merleau-Ponty does is he still allows us to hold open the possibility for a kind of feminist ontology and phenomenology there's nothing in there that says this couldn't happen it couldn't be achieved it couldn't you couldn't sh you couldn't shape that um, and in that way, I think he's probably more enabling than anything else. But one of the, in parenthesis, one of the kind of key errors in all of this too is the assumption that somehow when we turn to phenomenology, we're turning to a method or methodology. And this gets all very confusing within the context of a kind of a learning, teaching and learning environment like our own, where you're often introduced to theories and methods, and then phenomenology is often one of those, and feminism might be one of those another week. Phenomenology, I'd say, is more of an attitude than a, f than a methodology. I mean, you might say the same thing about fem feminism, if you like, certainly in art history. And so the two can have a much closer relationship, I think, than, um, than was first thought, um, for instance, by Judith Butler. Um, um, and when, you know, Amelia Jones writes about relationality, for instance, you know, she is dead set against that division between kind of, you know, the subjectivities and aesthetics. You know, that, those are the ones that, um, as I said there, they subtend patriarchal uh, and white uh, 
dominated supremacist kind of views of culture. You know, there is this thing called aesthetics, and we're going to. And so, I mean, my sense of discomfort in all this is that, you know, I don't want to be muddled up here, you know, for just like another one of those like white male, you know, aesthetician types who kind of comes along and then. For me, this is this is a kind of an excursus, if you like, in a context in which I'm trying to articulate this to perhaps a larger, uh, actually a larger critical project. Um, and in that sense, I share a lot with those with those feminist thinkers um, who are not uh, especially interested in kind of ontology for its own sake, but for what can be made of it in a field of action, which is a field of social and political action, to bring about different outcomes transformative outcomes for them. And I'd like to think I'm um, have more in common with them than, than, than differences. Hi, Leon. Thank you. That was a really, just really... ground to a halt there. Good. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, no. for your help. One last yeah. question. Oh, okay. yes. There was a, <laughs> there was a question. Um, I thought you were I dismissing me. No, not yet. Um, I think it was really, really helpful hearing her, her, her whole journey in terms of this, you know, I think some sort of battle between thinking about aesthetics and identification. I think it's something I constantly think of myself. So I think you've answered a lot of questions. So I'm just wondering what she's doing at the moment, like currently, because I think obviously within time, these things will change so mm -hmm. what really is the material nature of her practice now what media only working with moving image or is that um, to change so the, well this this is more recent work this one here and we probably have a few more followers in this room of Sonia Corano I see some nodding I see Amna Malik sitting there um, I think it'd be fair to say that she's kept up with all of these this range of media. I don't think she's neglecting any one of them. Um, and she is just, I can't really keep up with her um, either. And if she was here now, she'd sort of tell me off. She, I told you I was doing this work on such and such. She did an amazing work called The Oniric House, where she, she basically took over a building and did a full installation um, there. So, um, uh, using video work, um, using again s some of these techniques of um, repetition and rhyming and symmetry in video, um, using li actual life forms like insects, um, ants, um, and there's a whole kind of line of her work that I've barely begun to characterize, which is to do with um, the, the kind of sleepless body, um, insomnia, and so on. And in an, in an odd way, I kind of, which she wasn't doing in the 1990s in London, and in a kind of odd way, I feel as though I sort of saw the beginnings of that. Because when we first met, I mean, I, I, sh I should explain, I spent, essentially we spent like three non-consecutive nights together, completely awake. Um, and I'm pretty dedicated to what artists are doing, so I'm kind of, I fo kind of followed her for these th three nights. We, w one night I think was, a, was at her house in, in um, Somerstown, um, in London. Another was spent pretty much, I think, on the, sitting on the South Bank, and then another was back at her house. Um, remember, um, it was December the 12th, I think, of 1999. Um, and, I mean, the things that came up in that experience for me were all, you know, how do you cope with in, in maintaining a continuous line of uh, conversation, discussion through the night in an unbroken way when you're just, you, you're basically just kind of sliding into a sort of coma by about four o'clock. How do you manifest those, those feelings of um, sleeplessness in, 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 in different ways? I mean, she, she's, she seemed to have the edge on me and be able to do that in a way that I just couldn't. Um, I don't know who was the more tired at the end of those three nights. Um, I was I was absolutely exhausted, 
and it also affect, it affects, you know, there's a question of memory. I mean, I can't even remember, remember exactly what we were talking about, about looking at pigeons. And then, so years later, I found this, essentially, um, do it, doing these, these public works. Um, and I suppose in a way, you know, she's, yeah, I mean, to put some more sort of historical sort of frameworks around her, I would say she's probably, uh, or she's understood to be, if you like, one of the first or few uh, women artists working in India who have exposed the bodies and, and, and filmed the bodies and kind of done, done these, these video uh, pieces and distributed those. The bird piece in particular um, was, uh, drew an enormous amount of attention, uh, attention in India in, in the press at the time. And in a, in a strange kind of way, you know, uh, she did a show in um, the year 2000 at the British Council headquarters in Delhi. It was a solo show, and there was a publication, a publication essay. And so most of my ideas on this have been incubating for a while, and many of them were there in that original paper. And then they were uh, sort of folded into the field of reception, as often happens. So then I started to find that actually my kind of description, my writing about Bird, was sort of just like plagiarized all over the place in, in India and beyond. It became the standard sort of, you know, like the, the go-to explanation for this work. And in a way, it became the kind of justification for the work as well. And that lasted. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think in a way, I've kind of like had a bit of an impact on, on the better it works on, the, on what she's done. Um, so there's the stuff about sleeplessness, this is massive installations of the, the Orneric house, um, then these, these public works, um, and probably countless other directions that she's taken to at the same time, and she also writes. Yeah. <laughs> There are two questions from the third, second row. You're not going to yeah. let me off Last that two. easily, Last are two you? Questions. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, really, I, I think I, I'm kind of struggling exactly with the same kind of problems that you've been mentioning in terms of artists in relation to culture, identity, and of course, Rashid Doreen has written extensively about that. Um, I'm just really glad that a white male historian has actually come out with it and perhaps maybe you know, we've been talking about it. I mean, we've had lots of artists have been talking about this as a problematic, the problem that you're actually talking about. But maybe, maybe it would take a historian to actually um, bring that onto the table. I don't know. Oh, watch out there. Watch out there, but what can I one. say? I mean, it, it is a reality. <laughs> it's a lot of well, us um, who've been working um, um, kind of through these the significance of signifiers, identity politics, we've been talking about it, mm. but it doesn't seem to kind of register. And I think that, that has been my frustration. Mm. And perhaps it will take a white male historian to actually uh, bring some attention and give it some kind of validity. I mean, I'm saying it no. as a, you know, um, you know. Well, I find it a bit sad, you know. You well, it that. is sad. I mean, that is the reception that we have. I mean, I thought we were at a point where we didn't need a kind of validating white presence, um, and we shouldn't, but shouldn't either, shouldn't bank on getting one. I'm not sure I'm it, and I think there have to be more effective ways of doing it. I think it would be a bit weird if I was like, I think, you know, like, you know, when we we read we, Foucault, don't we? The power, what's the, the takeaway message is that power is distributed. It doesn't just sit in one person's hands. So you can't just have, you know, it's like, oh, you know, Wainwright decides he's going to pick up a pen on, oh, fantastic, we're all saved. Hang on a minute. Let's, yeah. I, what I would, what, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So am I a little bit. I mean, the 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 other thing is, you know, you don't really want to hope that you're going to have like loads and loads more white like keynotes or like events like this. You know what I mean? Like that's not that's not like on the that shouldn't be at the top of the wish list either. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I'm. I mean, that's about that's a political question, isn't it? Which personal there needs to be some sort of solidarity or something on what's actually needed the the business about visibility is such a it, it's such a that's such a nebulous one as well because i mean what does visibility count for you know years ago when i um was tell, talking to malcolm about this before you know a long time ago 18 years ago i embarked on this project to try to change the way that art history is taught in the uk art architecture and design history and we went to 47 different higher education institutions in the land, up and down the land, from to Aberdeen. And we asked them what you're doing in the way of changing a curriculum, making it more open, less Eurocentric, making it more culturally diverse was the terminology that we used at the time, more global was the word we used. And they were all doing a lot, actually. They were doing a lot to change that. Um, um, but many simply weren't. You know, they simply weren't. And what was revealing about a lot of white people kind out of the equation. So they would say, oh, well, hang on a minute. Um, like, you know, we couldn't possibly teach with any sort of authenticity, you know, a black British element within our undergraduate curriculum because, you know, we're white people. So, like, let's just leave that bit and wait. We'll wait, they said, until a time when the staff make up is more di itself more diverse and then I'd say well what are you doing what work are you doing to change that and they'd say oh well it's all you know matter and then you get this kind of preamble to change basically it was it wasn't changing in that respect at all what we also found is other people who kind of had a tactics of inclusion which was more like the differential inclusion right within the curriculum so they'd have this like black British topic but it would be separate from other things so it'd be visible you got you achieve visibility but did you achieve a kind of sea change to the underlying you know, sets of values, attitudes, the arbiters of value and all the rest of it within the curriculum as, as a whole? And the answer is probably no, right? So, so there was that there. Um, um, I mean, the other thing is that for a long time I've, I've had work like this, which I just didn't publish because I, I just didn't think it was really needed because things seem to be moving quite well on their own. Um, but actually, I think that... Um, I think you can't let the white people off the hook, you know, so uh, maybe I've, for them at least, I might be a kind of fly in the ointment. Or it might work the other way, and they might think, well, as long carry on and do the other thing that we are always happy to do. So there are no guarantees, I don't think. And it's a politics that have to be worked out from a notional community of people who themselves were kind of a... Do you know what I mean? But I'm, I, I like your optimism, but I'm just not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. No, I appreciate um, your interest. Amna, did you have a question? Right, thank you, okay. Neon. Thank you. Thanks.